So what I'm going to do today is basically take up the C6000 architecture. I will uh, sort of you know go through it uh, briefly to explain what the main uh, components of that architecture are. And uh, in the process, what we are going to do is take up a simple example code, right? Essentially a dot product, a vector product between uh, two arrays, show how it could be implemented on uh, this architecture and how the architecture allows you to apply various kinds of optimizations in order to bring down the running time. Okay. Uh, in the process, hopefully at least, you know, some of the uh, concepts that we have discussed in the course should become, you know, should be visible in the way that we discuss it, right? I mean, it's not going to be directly, I'm not going to say or directly, you know, this is what is done over here, the, or this is this particular transformation, but hopefully most of the ideas at least come through from uh, the way that we analyze this. Okay. So this is a picture of the internal block diagram. Let's, I need to zoom out a little bit. You know, this is a very rough picture of the C6000 uh, architecture. Okay. And uh, what I mean by the C6000 architecture over here is to basically say that, uh, so the first question is what is the C6000? Okay. Texas Instruments has many different DSPs. And by DSP, I mean a digital signal processor, right? Not DSP as in digital signal processing, but DSP as in a particular element, just like a CPU, okay? So what is a DSP? We discussed this earlier. Essentially what we have is, you know, there is this computational unit, the core computational unit, but it has certain kinds of specialized architectural elements that make it better suited for implementing signal processing type applications. Okay. So this particular block diagram, the structure that I'm showing over here is a very generic block diagram, right? All that it's saying is, you know, there is one CPU in the middle, right? Uh, uh, basically you have this, we have the CPU, we have memory and we have peripherals, right? These are the three main architectural elements of pretty much any kind of processing unit, right? And of course, what we have is there are these internal buses that connect everything together. So far, there is nothing particular about this architecture that you know should be uh, should surprise you or is different from any other kinds of uh, processor, right? Now, what? Let, let's take one specific example, right, of a problem that we want to solve. Something which is a sort of common occurrence in the context of signal processing and say, okay, you know, how would we implement something like this on a C6000 processor, okay? So what is the C6000 processor? Rather than trying to sort of explain what exactly is that family and so on, we will get to, you know, what are the main architectural elements in a couple of slides. And at that point, it should hopefully be clear what is good about it, right? From the point of view of implementation and how we hope to make use of that uh, hardware, okay? So first thing is let's come up with a concrete problem. And uh, you know, this is essentially the problem of finding a dot product. Y is equal to summation n is equal to uh, small n is equal to one to capital N, a n into x n, right? This is essentially a sort of a dot product or a vector product, right? Where the a values are some constants that are stored somewhere in the memory of uh, the processor. The x values presumably are samples of an analog signal, okay? So are most probably coming in from outside. But as far as a DSP processor is concerned, it may have an interface with uh, an analog to digital converter that it may or may not. But the point is that it is in general not going to have arbitrary shift registers built into it, okay? So when I say this XN, it looks like it is a shift register but it's basically implemented in memory, right? What I mean by that is the XN values will also be stored as an array in memory. So the AN values are going to be, a, you know, some array in memory, some consecutive set of values that are stored somewhere in some memory locations. XN values are also some uh, stored in some memory location somewhere. So the program in other words, will have to retrieve two sets of values from memory multiply them point by point, add up, and finally generate a result, okay? 
now why is this a common occurrence think about it you know any pretty much any kind of linear filtering fir filtering or even iir filtering ultimately boils down to this right i need to read in a set of coefficients and a set of present and past values of xn and possibly yn okay and multiply point by point do a summation and generate a final result okay what about a fourier transform if i use the regular definition of the fourier transform it exactly is this same thing right because ultimately what will happen is there will be a set of twiddle factors i need to multiply them point by point add up if i use the fast fourier transform algorithm then it changes slightly but ultimately i will still have multiplies and adds okay let's say i do some other kind of you know a dot product uh, distance finding or any other kind of uh, similar you know a correlation all of those kind of applications ultimately turn out to be dot products okay so that's why this is i mean ultimately if you look at the history of dsps they pretty much come from that uh, line of attack right i mean this is the most common uh, uh, type of operation that is to be implemented in signal processing applications so let's try and speed that up so what we are going to do is to try and see if we can write some code for this algorithm and also develop the architecture right as we go first thing to ask is what are the two most, uh, most basic instructions required for this algorithm right and let's think about it purely in terms of the arithmetic operations right we need to multiply right so this becomes multiplication and we need to do addition right both of these things are required in order to complete this dot product so what they did was as far as uh, architecture is concerned right now we are basically saying what are the main architectural elements what are the kinds of things that we need to introduce into the architecture okay the so in some ways you can sort of think of this as the problem of you know the scheduling allocation binding right this what we are doing right now is an allocation problem okay we are saying what kind of resources and how many of those resources do we need right now although i am trying to sort of make it look as though you know this is a very systematically designed system uh, you know uh, architecture and you know this is exactly the allocation you need and so on as you will see you know this is well designed for this particular problem if the problem is different in particular you know even if it's something as simple as an fft rather than a, a dot product you will find that maybe this particular architecture is not the best suited right so whatever sort of explanations that i'm giving over here are you know you should understand them in the spirit that they are being given right i mean it's sort of a motivating example of how you can go about designing an architecture but this is not necessarily the best possible architecture for a signal processing a uh, signal processor right it turns out it's good for certain kinds of applications there might be other things where it does not do quite so well anyway the bottom line is the first thing that we will need for sure is going to be a multiply unit okay something that can do multiplications since we have to do so many multiplications let's put in custom hard hardware whose job is only to do multiplication okay and what we have over here is the assembly language instruction right corresponding to that multiplication okay so the assembly instruction itself is mpy right so this basically says this is the uh, operation to be done multiply two values okay this indicates which hardware unit okay so in other words this is the binding problem okay and finally we have the three values right so this is the source one source two and destination so you take a x multiply them and store the value into prod these are just defined as variables clearly when i actually write it as code i will need to have some kind of registers into which they are mapped now the next operation that i need to do as i discussed before is add okay so once again same story this is the assembly language this is the uh, binding and you know these are the variables so so far we have two types of hardware right there are dot m multiply units and dot l add units now you know you might ask the question why did i have to create a separate multiply unit and a separate add unit 
like i said you know even though i am trying to give the impression that this is a very clean design and so on those are choices at the end of the day some architect decided that having a separate unit to do multiplication and a separate unit to do addition was the right choice for this particular system okay uh, there are other processors or other systems in which there is just one multiply accumulate unit to net which can't really do multiply and add i mean uh, which can do multiply and add as one operation even right so why did they choose to do multiply and add separately over here it turns out that it's a good way of designing the rest of this architecture but it's by no means the only way to do it right so let's move on like i said you know you have this thing that the a x prod y all of those are variables right but they need to get mapped into registers somewhere okay we create a register file so what's a register file it basically means that i should be able to read values out of the register file multiple values at the same time and i should also be able to write one or more values into different locations in the register file at the same time right so this register file can be thought of as a type of memory but you can read and write multiple values at the same time okay now how many it's not arbitrary it's not that i can read 10 values if i want and write five values if i want and so on it has some number of ports so the number of ports that are present over here will determine how many values i can read out at the same time and how many values i can write into it at the same time now in this particular case what it basically says is all of these are read operations right and at the same time what i have is that these things are write operations okay which means that i need to be able to read out at least given what i have over here i should be able to read at least four values in a given cycle and write two values in a given cycle if i want to be able to do these instructions at the same time do i want to actually do them at the same time in the same clock cycle that's also not very clear right now at least the way that i have written it i am not doing it in the same cycle i'll probably do the mpy first and the add in the next clock cycle in which case i only need to read two values write one value okay now i also need to have something which allows me to implement this loop right because i need to basically run it 40 times right so rather than if i unrolled this completely i would basically write y is equal to a0 into x0 y is equal to y plus a1 into x1 y is equal to y plus a2 into x2 i could write code like that that's a completely unrolled version of this loop right and in fact it might actually turn out to be very efficient but the bottom line is that you know it's not going to uh, be easy to write code like that and more than that it's going to be nearly impossible to modify it later what if i wanted to add you know one extra tap right make it 41 taps that's the end of the story i can't really do it at all with this way right so one thing you would notice is now these things have been replaced by register names but what i have over here is this branch statement okay now once again what ti decided in this particular architecture was to say that there is one hardware unit that takes care of branch related operations okay now what exactly does it mean in ultimately what does a branch imply in terms of uh, how the processor works it means that there is some program counter that is basically going you know plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 you know one location to the next the branch basically makes it rather than going plus 1 it makes it go to some other location in this case it probably makes it do some minus 10 or something like that go back 10 instructions go back some x number of instructions right so that branch unit ultimately is going to do two things one is it probably has to do some kind of a comparison of some value right there will be some counter and it will check whether that value has reached 40 or not and if it has or rather if it has not yet reached that value it has to jump back it has to change the value of the program counter okay so that is what the dot s hardware unit does now for this to work properly you need a loop counter okay and the way that they do this is they essentially say okay i will take this hardware unit the dot s which is going to keep track of my loop count initialize it with the value 40 okay 
So even though the code is written as n is equal to 1 to 40, you can see that the assembly language basically translates it sort of into 40 down to 1. Okay, or 40 to 0. It's basically going to do a subtraction and bring down that counter value. Okay. Why? Because typically speaking, comparing something against zero is a very easy assembly language. I mean, there are typically, you know, usually uh, one of the most common assembly language instructions will be just check if a value is zero or not. Okay. So rather than comparing whether A1 and A2 are equal, just checking whether A2 is equal to zero is going to be easier from the point of view of the processor architect. Now, what that means is I also need to have an operation that can decrement the loop counter. Okay. And you will realize that, you know, what is happening is this initialization happened in a dot S uh, unit, whereas the subtraction, right? This is the loop count decrement actually happens in the dot L unit. Okay. The point is both of those are capable of accessing the same register file, right? They have different functionalities. The dot s unit is used for initializing counters and comparing the value of the counter, right, and deciding whether or not to branch. Whereas the subtraction operation happens in the dot l unit. The dot l unit just specializes in add subtract operations. And finally, you know, this is basically a conditional branch. Okay. So where is the condition coming in? It checks the value of a2. If a2 is has become equal to zero, then it will not branch. Okay, this basically says a2 not equal to 0 branch to loop, right? Whereas if a2 is equal to 0, get out, just proceed to the next step. Now we are almost done. The only other thing that needs to be done is to actually load the values an and xn, right? So there is this an over here and the xn over here both of these need to get loaded in, okay? And what I'm going to do is assume that A5, this is basically a pointer, right? Both of these are pointers. One of them holds the pointer to the value An and the other holds the pointer to the value Xn, okay? So if I give this instruction load H star A5, it basically says look up the address in register A5 take the value from that address, right, from the memory corresponding to that address and store it into A0. Similarly, the next instruction is load the value from A6 from, you know, corresponding to the pointer in A6, go look up that memory location, load the value and store it into A1. Okay. And what we have is there is a dot D unit whose job is to specialize in these kind of memory operations, right. It also takes care of this final store operation. What is the store operation? Just writing back the value of y. Okay, so this is basically this location corresponds to y. Star a7, right? This is once again, this is also a pointer. Okay, now is this the best way of writing it? Am I using too many registers for this particular operation? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, this is an illustrative example. Okay. So what do we have? Ultimately, what the system looks like is this. Okay, I need to write this code. The first thing I'll do is, you know, initialize this uh, counter, right? This is load values and increment pointers, right? So you see what's happening over here, this plus plus over here, what it's going to do is, not only am I going to read the value from memory, I'm also going to increment those pointers so that automatically after reading a of zero, the next time around a5 contains a pointer to a of one. Okay, that's all I really need to do. I don't need to check whether I'm going out of bounds or anything because my this counter, this a2 counter is going to keep track of where I am and the number of times I have performed the operation and will get me out of the place correctly, right? Once I've finished 40 iterations. Okay, so this is how you would write the assembly language code for this operation. Okay, now here comes one interesting twist to the architecture. What they said is all of this, let's just duplicate it. Okay, now why exactly are we duplicating it? Because as you will see at the end, right, I mean that actually helps to significantly, I mean you can actually use the, that much uh, hardware, right, for an operation like this. Right. 
But the thing to keep in mind over here is you then have to ask the question, okay, why did I duplicate? Why not three times? Why not four times? Why not eight times? Okay. And ultimately what happens is that you are going to end up struggling with the some kind of bottlenecks. And what will those bottlenecks be? Ultimately, it is going to be one of the major bottlenecks is going to be this. Right? How wide of a bus can I get to the data memory? And how many values can I read from data memory in a given clock cycle? Okay. If you look at the previous code, you can already see that, you know, I am going to need to read a value uh, from A5 and store it into A0. Next time I need to read a value from A6 and store it into A1. And then eventually I, you know, after everything is done, I need to store a value back into the pointer A7. Okay. If that happens one after the other, it's okay. At any given point in time, I'm either reading or writing one value. So the dot B just has a simple interface to data memory. Over here on the other hand, right, I already need to double that bus width, right? The number of values that I need to be able to retrieve from memory has to be double. And it's not as simple as just making it a 64 bit bus. It actually means that I need to be able to retrieve from two different locations in memory. Okay. Now, what happens when I try to make it four or eight, right? At that point, rapidly after some time, the data memory that bus is going to become a serious problem after a while, right? On the other hand, as far as this particular system is concerned, the architects decided that two copies is a good idea. Okay. So let's quickly review what the code looks like, right? You start by initializing the loop counter, then load the values of A of N and uh, X of N. You say into the registers A0 and A1, right? A3 will then contain the value of AN into XN. A4 will have the value Y, which is Y plus A3. Decrement the loop count. Then if A2 is not equal to zero, branch back. And once A2 is equal to zero, come out and store the value in the pointer given by A7. 